All right, uh, for our first uh, session, I want to welcome out here someone who definitely is a force of change, Chief Executive Officer of the Game Show Network, GSN, and author of Catastrophic Care, Why Everything We Think We Know About Healthcare Is Wrong. Please welcome David Goldhill. Thank you, John. Good morning, everyone. I, I want to talk about the coming of a new master for American healthcare. But before I do, I want to get a little ugly matter out of the way, and that's to talk about money. We talk about money a lot in healthcare, mostly about how there's not enough of it to do all that we want. Well, I want to dispel that. Um, when I started work on my book, the first thing I did was ask, how much are we actually putting into the healthcare system? And I looked at a young woman who was starting work for us that year, and I looked at her share of premiums that the company uh, was paying, our share of the premiums, because of course that's coming out of her pay long term, her Medicare taxes, uh, her out of pocket, the percent of her state income taxes that funded Medicaid, how much she was likely to pay in Medicare premiums when she retired and joined the program, out of pocket then as well. I made a couple of very important assumptions. I assumed that she never got rich, that she had a middle class income growing at two to three percent over her entire lifetime. And I assumed she never got sick, and no one in her family got sick. If she got married and had a couple kids but was the sole breadwinner, and we didn't do any cost increases, literally cost of all those things increased by zero over her lifetime, and she lived to 80, she will put $1.1 million into our healthcare system. If healthcare costs grew at the rate that the GAO expected at the time over the next 10 years and then zero for the rest of her life, she'll put in roughly $1.7 million. If she has a spouse that works, she'll put in $2.5 million. Together, they'll put in $2.5 million. Now, she'll only see around 600,000 of that cost directly. She won't know about our share of the premium. She does now, of course. That's changed. She won't know what share of her taxes go to what. But here's the bind or the bound we need to have whenever we talk about health care. This is an average working person starting out today. Not a single one of these people believes that you can't run a health care system on a million eight of their money over their lifetime. Let's start there. This is by far the biggest amount of money we are asking our young people to pay for anything. Starting there helps, I think, understand what I'm about to say. 50 years ago, Kenneth Arrow, a brilliant Nobel Prize winning economist, wrote a very famous piece in which he said, healthcare could never be a normal industry because you could never have normal consumers. We don't know as much as the doctors. We're terrified. We'll buy anything they sell us. And that if you have a normal consumer-driven industry, you'll have tons of excess medicine and excess diagnosis and lots of care we don't need. So we need big intermediaries to be the customer for us. I'm not making a joke. He actually said that. We all know how it turned out when we took the consumer out. What we often don't realize, though, is how little healthcare has of what we now know consumers want from the consumer revolution that the internet and other information technologies made possible. We know what consumers like. They like speed, they like ease, they like access to their information, they like a provider who knows who they are, no matter how individual the service is, and they like to own everything themselves. Their own data, their own financial records, their own buying responsibility. Now, I think it is misunderstood how important the actual customer is and how an industry develops. I've been in a lot of different industries. Frankly, I have an extraordinary trouble holding a job. And so it's given me an opportunity to see something that if you haven't spent your life in healthcare, you know, which is every industry responds to the interests of its customers. That's its incentives. And whether we want to accept it or not, the incentives in healthcare are driven by intermediaries, by bureaucracies, by government, and by large, often monopoly insurers. Does it really matter? I mean, aren't they smarter than us? Don't they know more than us? 
So let me talk about the most complicated product ever introduced into the consumer economy in the history of mankind. 50 years ago, the year that Medicare and Medicaid were passed, the very first commercial mini computer was created. It was the PDP-8, introduced by a company called DEC, which actually no longer exists. And it sold for $19,000. It was designed just for large companies, not for NASA and the Defense Department and the IRS, the only people who could use a computer at that time. And that's what a computer looked like in 1965. Now, most of you either are or desperately want to be on this right now. There are two billion of these in people's hands, two billion smartphones. We fast forward 50 years later. Now, if this was a healthcare conference in 1965 and I said, we are going to get a computer in everybody's hands, everybody in the room would have said, how are we going to teach everybody how to use a computer? It's impossible. That could never be a consumer industry. You're crazy. 50 years of people saying, how do I make it so easy that the average person who has not the slightest idea how this works uses it for everything? 50 years ago, the computer industry changed its customer, and everything changed. Everything. 50 years ago, we perfected a system in which the average American is no longer the customer of his health care. And everything has changed. Now, I know most people in this room don't believe healthcare could be anything like any other industry because, as we all know, spending is highly concentrated. I seem to have missed my next slide. Any luck on that? No. I'll just hold it up. Um, the statistic which was always used was in any given year, 10% of the population uses 80% of healthcare. The number's now 65%. It's so concentrated, we all know that pretending it to be this consumer industry like computers or cell phones or hats is absurd because people who need healthcare need a lot of it. They're not consumers, they're sick, desperate people. So in any given year, 10% of the population buys 100% of the cars. In any given year, 10% of the population buys 100% of the college tuitions has 100% of the weddings, buys 100% of the refrigerators. When I'm given more than 18 minutes to talk, I go on like this for a very long time. Because every single expensive consumer good and service is consumed like this. Every single one. Healthcare is different in some ways. Obviously, we choose when to buy a house. We don't choose when to get very sick. But one of the things that we have completely failed to notice is that in many ways, healthcare has become like a typical insured sector which is there are a few risks which are truly rare, unpredictable, and major, but that there's a relatively stable spending course over your life, and I hate to tell most people this, but almost all of us are going to wind up in that 10% bracket for at least one year of our life, the same way we do in almost every other good and service. It doesn't mean we don't need insurance. It just means we don't need insurance for everything. Now, one of the things that everyone says in healthcare and that we all know is true how do you feel about a slide being misspelled? I don't think that's how you spell already, but I only have 18 minutes, so I had to compress everything. Um, we didn't take spelling in college, yeah. John, and that's yeah, the right, problem. Right. Um, my next talk is on the US education system, which is a catastrophe. Uh, here's the other reason we know that healthcare can't be a consumer industry. It's what my dear friend Steve Brill calls, when you have a heart attack, you don't want to go shopping, right? It's all urgent. It's major. We don't have time to have a consumer industry. So that is the equivalent of saying that the tire industry has to be organized around highway blowouts. Because in fact, what we have forgotten in this political debate we have about healthcare is that's not what healthcare is anymore. If you look at what we treat versus what we treated 20 years ago, What's incredible is all the stuff that was urgent, major, you gotta do today, you gotta do tomorrow, is now a tiny sliver of the spending. No matter what age group you are, anything that was urgent and sudden and major and no time for reflection is shrinking as a percent of the healthcare dollar and treatment. And everything that's about long term is growing. We now think that chronic conditions are 75% of spending and growing. And here's what's more important. When my mother had her cancer diagnosis 30 years ago, it was 
you've got to get on the table immediately. I'll come to this. I'm sorry. Um, it's not like that anymore. It's here are your choices. Here are your choices. We have the sector of our economy in which consumer choice is most important, in which we don't have a consumer economy. All the things we think about health, growth things politicians say, you get hit by a bus, you have a sudden heart attack, and we need your scary system to be there, is not what we actually do in healthcare. It's the smallest part of it. The opportunity to transform healthcare came from the nature of care itself. As care becomes chronic and requires the patient's involvement, requires the patient decision making, we lack the economic and institutional structure to support that, and we're hurting people by having that. This next slide, which many of you have already read, is about value and cost. So one of the reasons we can't have a consumer industry in healthcare is it's too complicated. People can't choose. It's just, there's too much, right? So here's two cars. There's an $8,500 Ferrari and a $12,815 Nissan Versa. Which one is more expensive? Now, to those of you in the back of the room who can't see this picture very clearly, it's a weird question. First of all, why is, how could a Ferrari be cheaper than a Nissan Versa? But for those of you in the front of the room, you can see something very clearly. The Nissan Versa is the lowest price new car you can buy in the US today. That Ferrari is the highest price model car you can buy in the US today. Which one is cheaper? Well, we have an entire price and economic system based on figuring that out. If you need a cheap set of wheels to actually get around, the Nissan Versa is cheaper. If all you care about is spending the least amount of money you can, buy the toy. Now let's talk about how the healthcare system does in terms of value. There's a lot of talk about how incredibly expensive Savaldi and all the new class of drugs is. And I'm not going to defend drug prices. They are set in a non-competitive, non-demand driven marketplace like everything else in healthcare. Prices in healthcare are monopoly prices that have no meaning. And that's important because prices are the circulatory system of the economy. But here's the funny thing about Savaldi. It was priced at $84,000, and the manufacturer said, you know what, we will guarantee cure. You're not cured, your price is free. We don't have that in the healthcare economy. In fact, if we did, well, we know what would happen if we did. Um, it still sounds like a lot of money, right? I mean, $84,000 for a pill when a statin is $1,000. But of course, we give a statin to 50 million people to save a million heart attacks. And Savaldi would be giving $84,000 only to someone who was cured of hep C. But here's the weirder thing. The average amount we'll spend on a person's health care over their lifetime is now $800,000. If I told you as a consumer, not as a health care person, I'm going to take 10% of your lifetime health care budget to cure you of a potentially fatal disease, still sound expensive? Or do you think, what the hell are they spending the other 90% on? Because that's what I think. If we can't afford some only, what are we buying? Let me give you another example. End of life care is everybody's sort of favorite whipping boy for excess cost. So the last Medicare data suggests it's somewhere around 50,000 per average senior. OK. So that's what? 6% of lifetime costs. Still seem expensive? I'm not defending the spending or what it's for. I'm not making a medical judgment. I'm just saying what kind of system spends $800,000 per person per year, not for life-saving drugs, and not for the last year of life? Where's it going? Point is, you don't know. Because you can't do, in healthcare, the Versa versus the toy analysis that we do in our daily lives every day. I'm optimistic. The new master is coming, and why? Well, part of it is the Cadillac tax. But more importantly is the change in private insurance, and surprisingly also in exchange policies, emphasizing high deductibles. High deductibles, like most things in healthcare, are understood from a healthcare perspective, which is, oh my god, you might not be able to afford some healthcare. Um, let me suggest a different way of looking at it that I see through my own employees. One of the interesting things about that concentration thing, that 65% that of healthcare being among 10% of the population, is a, some single digit percentage, between 5 and 10%, uh, is spent by 50. Most people, 
Most working people are in that 50 every year for a long time until someone in their family gets sick. Now you've got a high deductible health care plan. And some of them are really high. Some of them are $5,000 for individuals and $10,000 for families. What happens when you go two or three years without ever having a claim reimbursed? Do you think about the health care system differently? Do you think about your health insurance differently? Do you become a customer, an actual consumer in how you think of health care? Um, this is about change. And so I want to talk about the most important change in the history of the post-war economy. Literally changed everything. It's the box, the shipping container. The single worst idea ever, right? Because what was the idea? For thousands of years, the cost of trade has been shipping. And the only way to get the cost down was to, as efficiently as possible, pack a ship. That's what longshoremen did. That's why port cities had lots of employees. How do I use the hold of a ship most efficiently? Because the journey is really expensive. And then some guy came up with a great idea. Fill the ship with air. Just throw everything in a standardized box. So what? Most of the box will be empty. Most goods aren't square. There are, of course, now, to fit in the box. And just build giant ships, throw lots of boxes on. You'll save in the ease of getting them on and off, onto trucks, onto trains, whatever you lose in the inefficiency. Now, the, the box has changed everything, right? The box is responsible for the explosion in global trade. It's responsible for a billion people in Asia being lifted from poverty. It's responsible for where cities are and which cities failed. It's responsible for the destruction of unionized labor at ports everywhere. Lots of good and bad things, but the important thing about the box is nobody wanted it at all. Every single established interest hated this idea, and it cost billions of dollars to retrofit the world economy to accommodate the box. By the way, just to give you a sense of the box, the estimate is the amount of inventory we need to keep on hand because of the efficiency of shipping has declined by trillions of dollars worldwide in three generations. But the thing we need to know in healthcare about the box is every single person who was an interest hated it. The only people who benefited were people who buy stuff in stores. That's it. There was an actual customer that could override the interests of all established interests, and shipping and transportation had established interests as powerful in every country on earth as you can imagine. A real consumer won. We talk all the time about where's the Steve Jobs in healthcare. The Steve Jobs in computer existed because he had someone to sell to. I spend a lot of my time with venture capitalists. Their problem isn't finding the Steve Jobs. Their problem is finding someone to sell to, a real customer. And that's why change is coming. Because good intentions, sainthood, what have you, does not transform industries. Pressure does. Leverage does. Changes of incentives do. And you don't need everyone to do it, right? We don't need every single person to become a consumer. But every single person who works for me under 35 finds the healthcare system absolutely absurd and is open to any other way of dealing with it that they can. Inside insurance, outside insurance, they don't care. They will be the force for change. Because once we see what they get, what their relationship is to the system, what their ownership of their information is, the rest of us will want it. And that's what drives real change both from inside and outside, the change in incentives. I was interested in healthcare because of what happened to my father. And my father was one of, depending how you measure it, 100, 200,000 people to die in his year of what is regarded as a preventable error. I had no interest in healthcare before then and couldn't imagine that his death would spur me to take the interest. I ran a movie theater chain where we had a rule that if a soda spilled, it had to be cleaned up within 10 minutes or we penalized the manager. It wasn't for liability. It wasn't because we were afraid someone was going to slip and fall. People almost never do. It was because Saturday night is date night when most of our revenue occurs. And it's young families hiring the sitter, finally getting away, finally getting their big night out. And if they walk into our movie theater and there's a soda stain, the night just feels a little less good. And they may not do it again. And that's it. And we didn't have soda stains that weren't cleaned up in 10 minutes. Where's that pressure in the healthcare system? 
Where's that fear of the irrational consumer who doesn't understand how complicated it is and doesn't appreciate how difficult healthcare is, who just cares about the results? Well, that person is coming. And the reason that person is coming is because in healthcare, almost unlike anything else, we have 315 million stories about dysfunction. Oh, it could be simple ones, long waiting room lines, files misplaced, poor communication between the primary and the specialist, all the way to the major ones. Comical use of information technology at even our highest level institutions. Accidental death and injury. 315 million people as consumers, not as healthcare experts, regard this as the worst customer experience they have. And if we believe that healthcare is so important that that doesn't matter, the good news is that's about to change. The irrational consumer, the one who doesn't understand the story like CMS does or the big insurer does, doesn't appreciate the complexity, doesn't care, is about to make their mark. The first piece I wrote about healthcare, I ended by saying, imagine if Medicare wasn't the customer for my father's death and instead said to my mother, you pay the bill, we'll reimburse you. Imagine trying to present my mother with the bill for killing my father. There wouldn't have been a 1% penalty. And that's what this industry really needs. That's what every industry has used to transform itself from the Steve Jobses to the entrepreneurs to those people inside institutions who want real change. You need powerful economic incentive. And I think the best news in healthcare is we're about to get the most powerful economic incentive of all, finally moving into the system. Thanks very much.